Why does it matter? Somebody said a while ago that we have less than 60 years of, of life left in our soils. We don't have any soil, folks. We aren't here. That's why it matters. I have grandchildren. I'm kind of concerned that they may have a future in this world. And if we totally destroy our agricultural soil, they won't be here. And there is no person in this room that can take a look at that spot right there, assuming that was soil we were standing on, and tell me by looking at it today and coming back two or three years from now, if it's actually improved or not. We don't have the capacity up here to remember what that looked like. So we need to have ways of actually documenting what did it look like on October the 15th in 2016. We come back out here on October the 15th, 2019, is it better or not? What does that mean? Is it better or not? We don't really know, unless we have some, some way of describing or some knowledge to measure some certain parameters, is it better or not? And so, so that's why it is important. And there's all sorts of different ways of monitoring it. There, there's many different, different ways. I don't know if it matters a whole lot which way you do it. I think the key is to do it, to document to yourself. To me, one of the easiest ways to take a, what I call fixed point photography, take a picture of it, put it in a computer file, Take exactly the same picture from the same same point three years later, look at that again. Put the picture side by side. You get 10 years of data there, you can start to see, am I going ahead, am I going backwards? Just by pictures. Okay. So, I think you started or ended um, the conversation with a call for policy that rewards farmers uh, for what you guys are doing. What what does it take in monitoring, or what are even common variables that need to be in place um, to monitor, or having to have some sort of consistency <coughs> in that? Well, I think think one of our speakers this morning talked about the Swiss model, which <coughs> which has a very definitive list of criteria that we need to follow to to be accurate worldwide. I think it is a global movement of monitoring carbon, and so we need to do it the same everywhere. Uh, the, mo the model that, that I'm following, when I, when I, the numbers that I shared with you this morning, are using soilcarboncoalition.org protocols, which are very, very similar to the Swiss ones, as I understand it. And uh, it's very, very definitive in how it's done. Uh, the key is to find the same spot every time you go back there, and make sure that, that you are extremely accurate in what you do because there is huge huge variabilities in soil so you know if i if i test that spot two years later i come and test this spot you know i can really fool myself big time i have to test this spot this year and this spot three or four years from now so it, so it's critical that those type of protocols are set up so when we start seeing these different numbers thrown at us we know that it's basically comparing apples to apples. It's not apples to bananas. Um, and something I've been trying to figure out for the last year, what, what the heck are you measuring? Um, okay, or what are we asking? What's, what do you so want? what in the soil, what variables? Carbon, are we talking now? Well, to know, to, to know that you're measuring carbon, like, can you just pull out a sample and it's clearly there's this much carbon in the soil or what? Okay, so how, what, what the protocol is for carbon is, is uh, we take take soil sample in this spot right here. It's burnt at a fairly high temperature. The soil is weighed. It's burnt. You, what, you measure the difference. That is the percentage of carbon. Carbon will burn out at high heat. And so then you, that gives you a number. The next step then is three years later, you go back to that exact same spot, take some more probes out, send it to the same lab that uses exactly the same protocols, and measure it again. Subtract the two is your answer. Yes? So, I was uh, asking people about those methods and they said that they can work, but if you don't control the chemistry really well, there can be differences in like different kinds of carbon takes off at different temperatures and different types of soils. Other, you know, carbon compounds in some soil that isn't, and others that aren't organic, inorganic carbon. Um, you need to be careful with different 
type of soil that address? I think there's a lot more people, a lot more qualified in this room to answer that question than I am, but I'll take a stab at it. From what I understand, you need to have a lab that can guarantee the same test year after year after year. And there is international lab standards that they they are required to, to meet that says that they can do that. So I could archive this sample 10 years later, I could test it today, archive half of it, send it to them 10 years later, and they should get exactly the same result. So you're not doing that yourself? You're saying no, heavens no, I'm sending that to an accredited lab, absolutely. Yeah. Hey, I'm smart enough to do something like that. <laughs> I'm doing good to find the same spot again. <laughs> That's a bit of a challenge too, I'll tell you, to find the same spot again. So the second piece of this um, conversation is also about networking. Um, and some wise people, uh, I think Nicole Masters was in the room when we were planning this meeting and talking about some of the most successful communities or people in soil health have been a part of a bigger community that has been working on this together and kind of like the networking we were talking about earlier today. What have you done in your community um, how has that impacted the way the networking and the soil monitoring have been successful in your community? Yeah. Well, I guess I'll, I'll start off at a fairly local level. And one of the things that, that we do that's maybe somewhat unique in Canada is when, when a holistic management course happens, we usually like to teach them in a six, two, three day segments. So I would get, uh, say, eight of you, eight couples in this room and we'd have a go at it for three days. I'd send you home to think for a week or two and then we'd come back and have another three day go. At the end of that, if I did my job reasonably well as a facilitator, hopefully there would be a community created from that group of people. And, and the hope is then that you would continue to meet on a fairly regular basis thereafter. In, in uh, our case, my wife and I, when we did the training, we have continued to meet every single month ever since. We've been at it, I think it's 13 or 14 years now, where we meet every single month as a group that took that original course. And sometimes we come home for that particular meeting and we look at each other as we're driving home and we could have just as well went to town and had coffee and it would have been just as useful. But the next meeting you go, wow, we really did some learning here. And you have to put in the time with people to get the trust to, to make these things happen. It just doesn't happen if, you know, we meet once in a while, oh, how is it going, you know? And that's basically as far as and deep as it gets. If you want to get deep, you need to move out of your comfort zone. And in order to move out of your comfort zone, you have to have trust. And the only way you'll get trust is to put in the time. And so it's a commitment, but it's also a powerful, powerful tool in your toolbox. And I'll just share one little example. A number of years ago, my son came back and we decided we were gonna change the way, or he decided we were gonna change the way we fence and all these things. I was pretty happy with how it was, but he was young and didn't have any money and dad had money. And so we decided that we should put in a pipeline. And so this was a considerable expense. And when you start to put money into the ground, you kind of want to be sure that you're not going to make a mistake. And you say, gee, two years later, why did I put, waste my money putting it there? It should have been over here. So we didn't want to make those errors. So him and I had come up with what I thought was a pretty reasonable plan. But I wasn't quite sure yet. So I took it to our management group. And I, just, I didn't show them my plan. I showed them my maps and what we were trying to accomplish I broke them into little small groups like you guys are sitting at, and I said, figure out what we should do. And I think I had, in our group, I think I had three, three separate little groups, and they all basically came up with exactly the same idea that my son and I did. When I heard that, that gave me a heck of a lot of power in here to know that this was the correct decision. And that's what a management group can do for you. And so that's one of the things that that when I and, and, and all of the people in Canada, when we teach holistic management to a group of farmers, that's one of the things that we really try and encourage is them to get together. Now, it doesn't always work. Sometimes there's con uh, you know, personality conflicts or whatever and the group just doesn't gel. And, you know, but what we say then is you know, keep in touch. You know, we do have newsletters, we do have annual conferences and things like that. Uh, 
So, so we try to accommodate those people, but, but ideally we get this network of people that starts. And then from that, we start to learn more about soil health, human health, financial health, all these things, and we continue to learn as a group. And that's probably what's got me to the point where I'm now doing this carbon stuff. Are there questions? Yes. Our group? Yeah, if there's things that you tend to go over, or if it's just like a casual meeting. Um, the, the question was, do we have structured meetings? And how it works in our particular group is that we have no schedule. So when we, at the end of our, each meeting, we'll say who's hosting the next meeting. And it could easily be that we'll do it twice in a row. Might be two years till somebody does it. That's perfectly fine. Nobody says, well, gee, it's your turn to get doing it. When you're comfortable and ready to do it, you do it. If I'm hosting the meeting, I will create the agenda. The very first item we always have, is there any urgent items? So if I have a burning issue, whether it's a personal one, whether it's a financial one, whether it's a pipeline issue, that takes precedent over anything else and we deal with that first. That's our number one purpose as a group, to help ourselves. But assuming there's nothing, then we'll go on to whatever the host agenda was. And you know, they may have a thing about whatever. Right at the moment, the last year or so, we've actually been going back and rereading the book, the Holistic Management book, and each, we have a segment assigned each, each month and so the host will then say, is there any questions about this section? We kind of go through it quick and just to kind of refresh our memories about, you know, some of the things we probably forgot. But that's how it's, that's how we've structured it, it's our group. There's no formula, it's just kind of the uniqueness of the group and, you know, there's tremendous power in the people. <laughs>